Well, as I said in Bible class, it is good to, to be home. We did have a very good trip. Last week was the beginning of the gospel meeting at, at Elizabethtown, and Kay and I were able to see Mike and Mary Green. Uh, Mike and his wife were in Elizabethtown for about four years when I was there as the associate minister, and it was always, it's always good to see old friends, but especially those who were your co-laborers in the church. As I said earlier, it's good to see all of our visitors out, especially want to call and say how good it is to see Sister Teriyaki Anderson. They're sitting back in the back, so uh, we're glad that she is able to get out and feeling well enough to be able to be with us. Appreciate Brother Kenny teaching my class last Sunday morning. Understand it was an intense period of questions and answers. A review of sorts of the things that we had studied in the book of Genesis. Also to Brother Joe Venable for filling the pulpit. I uh, not watched his whole sermon. I've only seen parts of it, Brother Joe, but what I heard were excellent. And to Brother Mike Wages for filling in on Sunday evening for the devotional period here in Sunday. If you have your Bible... Go ahead and open it to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And I, I almost, as the scripture reading, put down from verse 1 all the way down almost to the end of the chapter, Brother Joe. And I appreciate you going back. So that's the context for this lesson. In my office on a thumb drive or a CD somewhere, I have a... 250 to 300 page book entitled Deuteronomy chapter 32 A Study of God. Yes, brethren, there's that much material in this chapter for one to write a book, and it's a study book on God. And as you look at this chapter, the Song of Moses. And normally, as the title of the lesson is, a faithful God. You and I understand when we speak of being faithful that it is more related to our being faithful to God. And we fail oftentimes to realize how faithful God is to us. We place so much emphasis, and rightly so, on why we should be faithful. But if it were not for the faithfulness of God, we would have no reason to be faithful in return. And so from our text, the Song of Moses, in this particular text is written about the time that Moses was going to transfer through God, I might add, the leadership of Israel as they are preparing to go and to take the land of Canaan. And so a transition from Moses to Joshua is going to take place. And Moses in this particular song, and that's what it is, he is going to include praise to God. He's going to speak of the conviction of Israel. However, the gist of the whole passage is the fact that God reigns supreme. That he loves his people and that he will take vengeance <coughs> on his enemies. Now, brethren, understand something. I'm not going to cover the whole chapter of De De Deuteronomy 32 this morning. Unless you want to be here from now until next Sunday. That's how long it would take to cover this one chapter. If I could cover it in that amount of time. Because most of you know how I am. I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. It would probably take more like uh, two or three months to cover the whole chapter. And, but I want to focus today specifically on verse 4. Because the verse 4 has three phrases in it that are very important to us, just as it was to Moses. Would you notice, first of all, what he says? He is what? Notice it says, the rock. God is the rock. And this rock that is represented here 
It is something that is solid. It is something that is immovable. It cannot be shifted with the sinking sands or the shifting winds. The same concept of that verse, that word rock, is used in Matthew chapter 16 and in verse 18. You remember what that says, I hope. If not, turn over there. You'll remember that is at the time when Jesus came. And he asked the apostles, who do men say that I am? And you remember the response that was given. Well, some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah. And even others say that you are just one of the great prophets. So mankind at that time was confused as to who Jesus was. But then he pointedly asked those men, Who do you say that I am? And you remember Simon Peter is always the anxious one, always wanting to be the first to speak up. He spoke up and said that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you remember Jesus' words? Do you remember what he said? He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bartone, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Brethren, let's understand when Jesus says upon this rock, it is the confession of, G, of, of Peter saying who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God. In other words, what Peter is saying is, you're just like this rock that is mentioned in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, that you are immovable. As a matter of fact, we can go to a lot of different scriptures, and I may not follow this outline completely. I may ad lib a little bit this morning. But we have other passages that tell us that Jesus is what? The chief cornerstone. That he is the one, the true foundation. And because of who he is, he is a rock that is immovable just as his father was. Turn over, if you will, to the book of Luke. And look in chapter 6, in verse 48. Luke 6 and verse 48, notice what Jesus says. He is like a man who is building a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. You remember that, right? The wise man, what? Built his house upon a rock and the rains came down and the floods came up. Oh, Brother Ray, why are you using a child song? I'm using a child song because it illustrates the point. Because the wise man, even when the rain came and the floods rose, what happened to the wise man's house? It stood what, Phoenix? Firm. Thank you. That's Jesus. That's God. The foundation is correct and therefore the house will stand firm forever and ever. And God being our foundation, when our faith and we build our faith upon Him from the words that He speaks to us, guess what happens to us? When we build on the right foundation, there is no power in heaven or on earth that can tear our house down. But secondly, when you think about God as this rock, he mentions this, Moses does, numerous times throughout Deuteronomy chapter 32. You can look down to verse 15 where he says, But Jeshurun Jeshura grew fat and kicked. You grew fat and you grew thick. Then he, or you are obese, then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. Verse 18, of the rock who begot you, you are mindful, unmindful 
and have forgotten the God who fathered you. Brother, do you see what Moses is telling these people? You have forgot from where you came. You have forgotten that it is the God, the rock of your salvation, the one who created you, the one who sustains you, the one who will continue to provide for you. All down through this passage, Moses is recording for us that God will always be there for us. But more than being a rock, more than being the rock, our God is one in whom we can find refuge. All throughout Deuteronomy 32. And I hope you take time to read this in its entirety instead of just listening to me this morning go uh, a little here and a little there. I want you to read the entire passage and see how Moses is ringing out the love of God. He's wringing out the love of God. He tells about how God cares for us. In the verse I just read, Jeshurun rejected God. But even in rejection, what did God do? God cared for His people. Even when we allow our foundation to shift off of the rock, who is there to care for us? It is God. You see, on through this passage, Moses records for us discipline that was shown by the Lord. But that discipline is a good thing because the discipline of God truly shows his love for us. But go to the second part of Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. Notice it says his work is perfect. His work is perfect. So I have a question for you. If God's work is perfect, why should we Seek to improve on them. If God's work is perfect, why do you and I and the world we live in think they can work to improve what God has already done? If we go back to the book of Genesis and look at chapter 1 and chapter 2, there in those passages which dealt with God creating the world that we live in, Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. After God had created everything on those five days, the Bible says God saw and it was anybody remember what it says? Saw that it was good. Let me allow me, if you will, God saw everything he created. It was good. Carlton, it was perfect. Just as God intended it to be. But then we transition. After God said to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, let us create man in our image. And remember, God created man in his image. But after that, the only time that my memory says when it comes to creation that God said it is not good for man to be alone. <coughs> so he caused the deep sleep to come upon Adam. He took a rib out of his side and he created what? Woman. And when God saw the woman, it was good. It was good that God had created for man a help me. It was good that God, through woman, or excuse me, through the woman, perfected. That's why he says, 
Therefore shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. God's plan, everything was perfect except he saw man was alone, so he fixed that. Why do we seek to improve upon his perfect work? Maybe I ought to put it this way. When you and I seek to improve or we fail to do what he has called us to do, are we not in essence saying we know a better way than you? We know a better way when we fail to do what he has asked us to do. So someone says, well, Brother Ed, what is it that God calls us to do? Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16. Notice what is written here by Peter. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Number one, God calls us to be holy. But then we can go back to Matthew chapter 5 and look at verse 48. Matthew 5 and verse 48. The scripture says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. How will we be perfect? By obeying the words of God. By understanding that His way, not only is it the best way, but His way is the only perfect way. The scripture also says that he's given unto, unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What does that mean? God has given us everything we need to know about how to live a godly, holy life. How to overcome worldliness so that we might attain heaven as our home after our life on this earth is done. You and I, very simply, are called to be like God. Well, someone, just for the sake of argument, because some of you like to argue, and if you want to argue this point, that's fine. But turn over to the book of Hebrews chapter 1, and look at verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of His glory... And the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Who is being talked about that? Is it not Jesus being spoken of there? Because in the previous passages, he says that in these last days that God has spoken to us through who? His Son. Question. If you want to argue and say, no, Brother Ray, we don't need to be like God. We need to be like Jesus. Where do you think Jesus learned to be holy, to be faithful? Where do you think he learned that? Because he is God. He was God in the flesh. So you're arguing a semantical point. You and I are called to be like God. So the question might say, Brother Ray, how then do you explain to me how that we are to be perfected? Turn to 1 John chapter 4 in verse 18. And I could use several different passages, but I think John sums it up in this one. Where he says to us, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made, y'all got this? Perfect in, what's that word? Love. How do we become perfect? We become perfect. By our love. 
whether it be our love of God, our love of our fellow man, that's what we're commanded to do. And so when you think about that, I believe what John is trying to speak of here is don't be afraid to stand for God. No matter what's going on in the world, are you willing to stand for the truth of God's Word? Because what is His Word? It is the complete and perfect will of the Father. Point number three this morning. We go back to our text in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. And notice it says, For all of His ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright he or is he. Brethren, that tells me that God is a faithful God. It shows to me, and I ask you the question, what do you think of when you hear the word faithful? What does that word faithful really mean? Faithful, when we hear the word, ought to bring up the idea of being committed. So I said, well, brother, how do, you, how, do you, how do you come up with this thought that we ought to be committed? Well, let me just ask it this way. If you were to compare your faithfulness to God to God's faithfulness to you, how would you measure up? How, how would you measure up if you compared your faithfulness to God to how faithful He has been to you? How would you measure up? Let's say you put it on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being the highest, 1 being the lowest. Where would you be? Let's be honest with ourselves. I don't think any of us would be up there in the 10 range, would we? To be in the 10 range means that you would be without sin. Would we be in the 5 to 9 range? Or would we be below the 5 range? If we're not striving to be the 10, then our faithfulness to God needs to grow. We need to become more dependent upon Him because He's always been faithful to us. And though it might scare us to think about our faithfulness compared to how God has been faithful to us, there is good news in that passage. There is good news in that statement. We can always walk. Him prove. Why are you here this morning? Maybe I ought to ask you that one. What is your purpose for being here this morning? Oh, someone's going to say, Brother Ray, I'm here to show my faithfulness. Okay. I'll give you that one. But is that why we're really here? We ought to be here so that we can grow our faithfulness. You see, worship coming together is an outward sign. But it's not all there is to being faithful. That's what some people think. Well, I went to church this morning. I showed my faithfulness. I partook of the Lord's Supper. I paid my fire insurance. Is that what being faithful is all about? Being faithful, yes, coming together is part of it. But the biggest part of being faithful is when you go out those doors on the right and the doors on the left, and you go out through the double glass doors at the front, being faithful is included in what you do when you're outside this assembly. There's a whole lot more to faithfulness than just coming to church. How 
has God been faithful to us? In what way has God been faithful to us? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3 says, He strengthens us and He protects us. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. I, I want to turn, I want to read that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 13. This verse sums up what God does for us. It says, if we are faithless. What does it mean to be faithless? That can include having no faith. That can include having a weak faith. That can include having a mediocre faith. If we are faithless, the Bible says, he will remain faithful. No matter what I do, no matter when I sin against God, He's always there for me being faithful. He is faithful to His promise. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, if we are trying to improve our faith, the Bible says what? If we walk in the light as He is in the light, He is, what's that word? Y'all know what that next word is without me telling you? The Bible says He is faithful to forgive us. Did you catch that? As long as... as, as as long as I'm trying to increase my faith and serve Him in the way that He wants me to serve Him, even when I become faithless, that's what sin does to us. Sin shows a lack of faith. God is faithful to forgive us. The Bible also says that we must confess those sins that are of public nature before Him somewhere and before Him. We've got to acknowledge that our faith was gone. 1 John 1 verse 9. How can I demonstrate my faith? Number one, I can be dependent upon God. We go back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and look at verse 12. To notice what Paul says in inspiration. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Is that being dependent upon God? How many of us rejoice in hope? How many of us are appreciative of the hope we have of an eternal life with God in heaven for eternity? Do we rejoice in that hope? How about being patient in tribulation? Wait, oh, wait a minute, brother. What do you mean patient in tribulation? The Bible says that we're all going to go through tribulation and trials, doesn't it? Being faithful in tribulation is our reaction to what we have to go through. And I like the last one too, by the way. Persistent in prayer. Persistent in prayer. I'll make a deal with you. If someone can answer this question, no. I'll close my iPad, close my Bible, offer the invitation, and we'll be done. And I'll give you a 15-minute sermon tonight when we talk about potato chips. Who here does not believe in the power of prayer? And I'll step back and give you a moment. I'm not done yet. And you're not getting a 15 minutes. Early. I look back through this glass right over here to my left. 
And I love Teriyaki Anderson. And she has told me on more than one occasion, and you can shake your head yes if you agree with me, do you believe in the power of prayer that it is what has carried you through to be back today? And she's shaking her head yes. It brings tears to my eyes to think of one who would not believe in the power of prayer. How about our ability to minister or serve others? What does that mean? What does it mean to serve or minister to others? Sometimes it may mean to provide food. Sometimes it may mean uh, to, to give someone a ride to a doctor's appointment. But one of the best ways that I know to minister and serve the needs of others is to sit down, to shut my mouth, and to just listen to the concerns that someone has so that I will know how to help them. Sometimes I'm not very good at that. And for that, I ask for your forgiveness. Someone says, Brother Ray, you... No, not always. Not always. Faithfulness is living our lives based on the word of God. So this morning as we close, folks, friends, understand something. God is our rock. He is our foundation. He is our refuge. All that he does is right. And we know that he is faithful to us even in our darkest moments when we are not faithful to Him. As long as this old world exists, God will be faithful to bless His creation. But He also at the end of time will be able, will be faithful to bring vengeance upon those who do not obey His word. So the question for you this morning is, are you faithful? Or are you an enemy? This morning, if you're on the outside of Christ, and you're looking for some way to serve Him, why not become a Christian? Why not come with a heart that has developed a deep faith, knowing the need you have to respond to His invitation, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Won't you come with a heart of, of faith that knows you need a change, that you need to repent, and that you need to confess, just as Peter confessed, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and knowing that you need to be baptized, immersed into the waters of baptism, where the blood of Christ contacts you and your sins are washed away, and you rise to walk in the newness of life, Romans chapter 6. Or this morning, have you become one who is rebellious and your faithfulness has weakened? God is still your rock. God is still there to meet your needs. You can come again with a heart that's penitent, as Brother Joel said in his prayer. Again, the desire to leave the evil ways to live the way of God. Confess your sins if they're of a public nature before this assembly and before God. Will you let us pray with you? Will you let us pray for you? That's one way that we can serve you is by giving you the encouragement you need as we journey from the earthly life to the heavenly life. This morning, if you have a need, our prayers come while we stand and while we stand.